I think with the biggest challenge we've had with infrastructure, it's always been kind of held off to the side. It's always been something that's been siloed and not connected to some of these issues around the economy, which focuses on jobs, which focuses on some of the fiscal health of states and metropolitan areas. Infrastructure really is a part of that, but it's a driver, it's a deliverer. It's not the end in and of itself. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, infrastructure and jobs. The bridges we cross, the roads we drive, our waterways, harbors, and sewer systems, our trains, subways, rapid rail, and our broadband connections, they're all part of the nation's massive infrastructure. Necessary for a day-to-day -day living and a key economic driver, infrastructure projects can create jobs and help strengthen the economy, but only if they're done strategically, notes senior fellow Robert Puentes. There are many drivers of economic growth in this country. Infrastructure is clearly one of those. Um, infrastructure is not the economy itself, it's not the end game, but infrastructure is a way um, and a key driver to advance those things about the economy that we want. So if we're moving to a next American economy, that's um, uh, fueled by exports, that's powered by low carbon, that's rich with innovation, and that provides opportunities to broad segments of the society, there are specific infrastructure projects that you need to do um, to enable those things to happen. Um, and if you follow that logic, it leads you not to bridges to nowhere, but it leads you to modern ports, to advanced telecommunications, um, to rich and clear transit. There are a lot of things that you can look at through the infrastructure lens if the American economy is your end game. If infrastructure is your end game, we're gonna waste a lot of money, we're gonna spread a lot of projects around very thinly, like peanut butter, and we're not gonna get that targeted kind of economic focus that we need for these projects. Does everyone view infrastructure projects in the same way? And by everyone, I mean the federal government, state governments, and uh, municipal governments. When you leave Washington and you talk to elected officials and policymakers and business leaders and other leaders in metropolitan areas, infrastructure is always at the top of the list because they understand very specifically the projects that we need to build to advance something that's new and the things that we need to maintain uh, in order to, to, to continue to have these places operate the way that they're supposed to. So if you're a, a port city um, or a gateway to some international destinations, you understand the key role that that plays um, in the global economy. Um, if you are uh, a place that's heavy on manufacturing, you understand that logistics and those things that help you produce those, those goods is gonna be really important. And the other big thing about infrastructure projects is jobs. Infrastructure puts people to work. The connection between infrastructure and jobs has always been um, a clear one. And uh, indeed, a big focus of the recovery package uh, was on those short-term kind of construction jobs, providing a boost um, uh, of, of stimulus that could get projects moving. Um, again, for short-term kind of things, some seasonal work, but very project kind of specific. Um, and that was the emphasis of the recovery package. It gave rise to this term, shovel-ready projects, which became kind of a household phrase. The challenge though is making sure that we're not just giving somebody a shovel and having them fill in a hole, but we're actually creating real value for, what, for, those, for those jobs and for those projects. So with a little bit of extra thought, with a little bit of extra strategy, we can connect those, those jobs to specific projects that deliver a clear economic end. So by connecting these things to these components of the next American economy, around exports and globalization, around technological innovation, around clean energy, we can put people to work today, but also sustain the economy for the future and create jobs long term. And Rob, you can't have a conversation about infrastructure without the three Ps coming up, private-public partnerships. We're going to have to rethink the way that we get projects done in this country. And one thing we really need to take advantage of are public-private partnerships, not as a silver bullet. It's not gonna fund every single project. It's not gonna finance every single project. But when you look internationally, at least over the last two decades, um, the United States has only made about nine, eight or nine percent of all these transportation public-private partnerships around the world. So clearly we're not taking advantage of these where they do make sense. And as we work with state metropolitan leaders outside of Washington, there are many projects that are ripe for this kind of investment. It's not a silver bullet. Um, it's not going to solve all of our problems, um, but there's clear resources that we can take advantage of. Uh, there's clear expertise that we can take advantage of uh, on the private side. We're just not doing that in the U.S. to the extent that we should. Rob, there's no arguing that a lot of the money for these projects are in the pockets of foreign investors. Yet here in the States, there are plenty of people who are a bit xenophobic about who runs our railways, who manages our harbors. 
there has been some queasiness about some foreign direct investment in infrastructure projects. Um, it's been around ports, I think, most particularly, mostly security-related issues, and there's some valid concern for all of those things. But it doesn't mean um, that we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there are, because we are in control of the infrastructure, we can structure these deals any way we want. Um, we do know that um, there is a lot of money that's sloshing around outside of the U.S. that's ready to invest in infrastructure. Um, if we don't take advantage of that here um, for U.S. projects, it's going to go elsewhere. So where do we stand with our infrastructure bank? Yeah, the National Infrastructure Bank is, uh, has been the next greatest idea for, for two decades now. And there's no doubt that it's, that it's absolutely needed because we don't really have that institutional mechanism for making decisions in a merit-based manner for those projects that truly meet uh, measures of national significance. If that's not going to happen in Washington anytime soon, we really start, we need to make sure that the states are, uh, continue to be the laboratories of democracy. There are 33 state infrastructure banks that exist across the country right now which was spurned on by federal, uh, federal action. But those infrastructure banks also need to be very strategic, very targeted, need to take much better um, use of, of merit-based decision-making so they're not falling into the same trap and just spreading money around very thinly around their state. So tell me about regulatory reform. It can either enhance or impair infrastructure projects. Th there's clearly some regulatory reform that has to happen, particularly for infrastructure projects that go across state lines. Um, there's a clean energy transmission project that goes across the southeast, for example, um, that's going to require multiple um, uh, regulatory review from different states, even the states where the energy is not being generated or where it's being delivered, but the place it's being transmitted through, right? So we've got to figure out how we can structure a regulatory environment that will allow these kinds of good projects to happen. Uh, we know in some places there's multiple levels of environmental review. Not to say that environmental review is not critically important, but we can do these things in more of a coordinated kind of fashion. Um, and then we know that in some places, particularly on the local level, uh, that the local codes aren't really seeing around the corner for the next round of, of, of uh, technological innovations around the built environment, around reusing water, around clean energy kind of projects. Some of the local codes just don't allow these things because they didn't know that they were, that they were happening. So we've got to update the stuff to take advantage of the technological advances of the 21st century. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your Blackberry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.